Hopefully these people we're about to speak about don't pale into insignificance by comparison. Um, the first two I want to talk about are two that you've said that the data appeals for. Um, the first one, and the headline act really, I guess, at the moment is Ruben Amarim. Um, what is it about him then, I suppose, in terms of the data and the numbers? There's the pros and there's cons. Of, he ticks a lot of boxes, it feels like. He's got a relatively decent amount of experience. He's won a, he's won a Primera Liga. And also, in the monks list, I wanted to ask you, it's something you've touched upon earlier. How styles across leagues and how comparable is it and how much you sort I guess is sort of bought into that because it must be difficult to look at the Premier League and try and compare that to the Premier League. That must be one of the hardest parts of all of this. Yeah, I mean, aside with that one, I do think that's massively important. It's massively important at the player level as well. I'm sure, you know, it's been discussed about Bundesliga tax and all of that sort of translation. And Darwin Nunes being an example in the Premier yeah. League of kind of needing a bit of time to, to adapt to the, the physical demands of the league. And, I think that that holds true at the the team level, and of course the the league level as well, because of style. Yeah, definitely with style, whether it's more possession based, maybe more aerial based, more physical, whatever it may be, but also kind of the the, the strength and that mm -hmm. difference between the the top team and the bottom team. And yes, there's a big gap between Liverpool, Manchester City, Arsenal, and Sheffield United and Burnley. I, I get that in, in the Premier League, but. I think from again from listening to to podcasts and and speaking to to people like those at Twenty First Group is that I don't have the exact comparison, but I think maybe the lower echelons of the Premier League, maybe kind of more Championship upper echelons of League One in terms of that quality. So naturally, a team like Sporting Lisbon or Benfica or Porto are going to still kind of always rise to the top because they are just notably and will continue to be notably better. So. The same with the area divisi to, to a certain extent as well, where these are really good leagues, but that difference between the the good teams and the those who are fighting relegation is quite big. So you're made to kind of look a little bit better. So yeah. it's all of those things that are factored into it, taking it sort of with a pinch of salt. But in terms of Amarim, um, you know, what's his pros and cons? I know it's been covered in great depth in the, the deep dive with with Chris and, and Josh Williams recently. Um, so I won't go kind of too much and and you know duplicate what Dave said, but I think that you know what one thing they did say, which was absolutely true, is that out of possession, and not just saying that the back line and the defensive side of things is is their strength, but just overall from pressing from the front, their their real sort of strength and keeping sort of central areas really nice and, and compact and forcing the opposition to go around them. I think that their um, their defensive numbers are just outstanding. So the numbers on that is that they have conceded this season just 0 0.66 expected goals against per 90 um, and for contact for context Arsenal um, who we've lauded as the best out of possession team in Europe if not the world are pretty much exactly the same there so context of what I just said about the, the league quality but still it shows that, that Sporting are definitely doing something right in terms of the process there mm -hmm. um, so I think that yeah defensively out of possession they're so strong um, in that regard as I say pressing from the front and sort of keeping those central areas um, keeping the opposition out of those central areas I think another pro is that again it's been spoken about from from Josh and Chris that the way that he has dealt with the the losses of players we spoke about Alonso just then in terms of maybe not evidenced it or had the chance to, to evidence it yet but the way that in the short space of time that Amarim has been manager they've he's lost uh, Manuel Lugarte Pedro Porro Joao Polina Mateus Nunes Nuno Mendes all of those young players in recent years and sort of regenerated and they are top of the Premier League. So I think that's one. Um, another one that, that I understand from my colleague David Ornstein, he said that his his use of the sports science side of things um, has sort of um, been a key sort of tick in the box in terms of how he deals with, with injuries, keeping players fit. Um, I think that one of his fitness staff, um, his current fitness staff used to, to work at Liverpool. So I think it was a strength and conditioning coach. So that's all kind of yeah led to positive sort of uh, signs, should we say, because Liverpool, I mean, every club has got his injury issues, but Liverpool in maybe recent years have, yeah. have had some, some injury issues and sort of wondering why that might be beyond just kind of bad luck. So that counts sort of really strongly as well. And I think that, as Jurgen Klopp has shown across his whole tenure, but specifically this season in terms of promoting youth, we don't have to discuss any more about what you know Jurgen Klopp doing that. But uh, but Amrim has done that really really well in 
in the likes of Pedro Parra Mateus Nunes as I mentioned before but um, Nuno Mendes as well who's, who's since moved on of course but um, it was Mandi Amande this season mm. he, he came basically straight into the team at 18 he's 20 now but was just trusted in a sort of a, a role in, in central defence that is not to be underestimated um, straight in and he's just looked so so comfortable but given that trust to be able to sort of play that role so um, I think that's those three, I'd say, um, have been key. Really strong defensively. Um, well, four, actually. Really strong defensively. Um, being able to regenerate the team. Dealing with with injury or making mm-hmm. sure that the strength and conditioning is really strong. And promoting youth. Um, a lot of boxes ticked, I guess, there. No, it certainly is, yeah. And it's nice to hear, to be honest. Um, in terms of cons, then, are there any standout cons for Ruben I mean, sort of... From my point of view, I guess in layman's terms, one of them would be, I guess, not progressing deep into Europe. But again, do you expect Sporting to progress deep into Europe? Since he's obviously been knocked out of the Europa League at this stage as well. So maybe there's something in that, but I don't know if you've spotted anything necessarily. Yeah, I mean, they overcame Arsenal, didn't they, in the Europa League last season? So I suppose they've shown a little bit in that regard. Um, Again, the the league quality means that it's... It's not necessarily a con, but it's a, a difficulty to to show the sort of the success and and translate it. Um, I think maybe they can be not as front footed or as maybe dominant against the the stronger sides within the league when you kind of really want to show that you are outwardly you know the best team yeah. in in that league. So that maybe feeds into the you know the strength on the European stage, and it's, it speaks to what I spoke about before in terms of if you can as a manager evidence that you are able to yeah, over, overcome teams who are really high quality, who we know are at elite level. And that opportunity is through European competition. If you are able to show that, then it really gives you, a, bumps you right up to the top of the list. So I'd agree with that. I think that the, there has been, you know, maybe a little bit of weakness there. I know that they were overcome by Atalanta, of course, in now Liverpool yeah. are playing in the, in the Europa League this season, but overcome Arsenal last season. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think it is fair to say, but, um, I guess overall, I can see why he's definitely in the the short list, if not, you know, the top two or three. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and I guess a lot of that sort of European conversation stems from what Jose Mourinho was able to do years ago, being in Portugal as well. But to emulate that feels now impossible. And everyone I've spoken to about Ruben Amorim, I've often brought up the Mourinho comparison, but it appears to be quite a lazy one uh, because they're simply both Portuguese and they both manage football teams. So yeah, that feels like pretty much where it starts and ends. And um, move on to the next one. Then the one, the next guy who the data appeals for, and this one is no great surprise to me to be. Honest. Julian Nagelsmann 